The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. All right. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to DIS One. Um, today we will launch into um, a couple more methods for evaluation, and to help you with that, here is a quick review of what we talked about before the uh, the Christmas break. Um, we had, first of all, a look at when, why, and where we evaluate and what some evaluation techniques are. And to classify those, you may remember that we broke them down into evaluations that happen with users and without users. Uh, without users, we looked at literature review and cognitive walkthrough, heuristic evaluation, and model-based evaluation. We mentioned those. And today, we're going to dive deeper into model-based evaluation and also get a start on a method that is a uh, heuristic evaluation. Um, and then with you this, we um, mentioned model extraction, silent observation, think aloud, constructive interaction, and retrospective testing for the qualitative methods. These were kind of building on top of each other, especially the first four. Um, and then as a quantitative method, we looked at controlled experiments. And since we're in a research environment here, uh, controlled experiments are something that you will quite likely run into and use in order to validate the results, for example, if you write a thesis at our lab. Um, all of these methods can be um, supported and extended with interviews and, and questionnaires um, in order to draw more information out of, from uh, your uh, testers that helped you evaluate your system. Usually, um, you have to make sure, of course, that you don't bias your testers, we talked about that a little bit. Um, and that is usually done by you know, doing those kinds of questionnaires or, or additional interviews or discussions um, after you've run your um, experiments. Participatory design was mentioned uh, as an extreme version, so to say, of, of involving your users in the design and evaluation process, where they really become a part of the design team throughout. Um, and uh, we had a look at a couple methods for how to deal with users, um, how to make sure we don't waste their time, how to treat them with respect, and also make sure that they don't uh, get stressed out because they think that they are being evaluated. Of course, we're not evaluating the users, uh, but they are helping us test the actual system and evaluate that. So as promised, today we're going to go into um, model-based evaluation, and we're going to start this off with, um, with GOMS. Um, GOMS, uh, to explain what that is, I want to uh, tell you a, a little story. In uh, 1995, um, Jacob Nielsen, um, who is now a, um, you know, a world famous uh, usability guru, especially focusing on web usability, um, had you know, just one day in order to uh, tell Sun, Sun Microsystems, big computer company at the time, uh, whether they should you know, whether it was a good idea to add three new buttons to their homepage or not. You know, they had done a homepage redesign and they asked him, hey, do you think we should go ahead with this? Um, he found that each new button that they put on their homepage, but that is essentially unused so that only very, very few people actually need to click on in order to get to information they're looking for, um, would cost the community of visitors to their homepage, half a million dollars per year altogether. Um, what does that mean? Well, you know, that number sounds kind of weird. Um, what that basically means is he figured out if you put a button on the homepage that hardly anybody uses, uh, you can approximate that as sort of, you know, an unnecessary distractor. And figuring out that that is not the button I need to click will take me some time. We're talking about seconds here, right? But if you have millions of users of your homepage and they're highly paid engineers that are looking for technical information, um, which you know can be expected if you're Sun Microsystems, uh, then you know this adds up because every second of that person's time is worth money because they're getting paid a salary. And if you add that up, all the visitors, all the extra seconds they're wasting browsing through your page without getting the information that they want, um, you know, that, that's a number that you can express as money, as dollars or euros. Uh, and that's what he did. And in order to figure that out, or as a result of his recommendation, 
two of those three new buttons that had been proposed were taken back out of the redesign. And the method he used for this quick sort of, you know, um, back of a napkin kind of calculation uh, and of this estimate uh, was GOMS. So that's the method we're going to look at today. If you want to find out more about uh, uh, Jacob Nielsen's work, then I recommend taking a look at his uh, articles on, the, on his uh, website. He is uh, one half of the Nielsen Norman group. And yes, the other half is the Norman that you all know and love. That's Don Norman. So they've uh, created sort of the Uber uh, web user, uh, usability consulting um, uh, group a while ago and have an excellent website that has very good, very practical, industry-oriented user research and user experience um, design uh, recommendations. So what does GOMS stand for? GOMS is an abbreviation of very handy. It's almost like it's designed for students to learn um, of goals, operators, methods, and selection rules. And those four things are the four main components of the GOMS method. GOMS is old. Um, but as I told you before, you know, in HCI, we're mostly, when we're looking at the things that, that concern the human, humans don't get upgraded all the time, right? So this stuff just remains as relevant as it was 40 uh, you know, years ago. So this was published by um, some folks that you also know already, Cart, Morin, and Ewell, uh, and you've seen the CMN model, right? And, and this was published in the Psychology of HCI, just as the GOMS model here too. And um, what Card and his colleagues did with the GOMS model was they created a mathematical model, and that's why we're covering it in this section, uh, that allows you to estimate execution times for using an interface before you actually build the system. And that sounds a bit like dark magic, right? I'm not actually creating the system, but I can still figure out how long it will take people to use it. How is that possible? Well, this is what they achieved, and that's incredibly valuable because if you don't need to build a system, you're saving tons of money in prototyping cost and time, of course, right? Uh, just like Nick Jacob Nielsen said, you don't need to build that website and you know, roll it out or test it with hundreds of people and figure out what happens. I can tell you right now. There's also variants of GOMS that, that can cover the learning times for an interface, which is also a very interesting aspect. You know, how long does it take people to get to grips with a new user interface? But we're going to focus mostly on execution times here. So um, what are those four components? Goals in GOMS describe the user's end goals, you know, kind of like what you've seen in Norman's you know, seven stages of action model. So they are routine tasks, uh, not too creative or problem solving. And this is a major limitation and also characteristic of GOMS. GOMS is there to estimate how long somebody who is very familiar with the task takes to do it. It's not about them struggling, finding the right keys and scratching their head. What do I need to do next? No, this is about somebody who knows what they're doing, going about their business as fast as they can. Okay, so this is important, routine tasks. For example, um, I've, got a, you know, I've got a paper draft um, you know, let, let's say, um, you know, Ollie wrote a paper draft and I'm going over it and I make some marks on it with like red, you know, old school, I print it out and use a red, uh, you know, pen and mark up some things. And now Ollie has to go back and, and put those changes back into the paper. Um, that's called copy editing, right? You know, bringing changes back into a document. And that's a, that's a task that is fairly menial. It doesn't require a lot of, um, you know, abstract problem solving thinking, you just do the thing. And that will be the example we use in, in GOMS here today too. Now these goals uh, will fall typically into, will, will sort of fan out into a hierarchy of sub goals in order to get all the changes that were ma marked up and highlighted in a, in a printed out copy back into the original text. Uh, you have to go through each of them and, and fix it, right? And to do that, you need to maybe delete characters or insert characters or copy and paste uh, blocks of text and so on and so on, reformat them, et cetera. So that's the goals. The operators are on the other end of that tree that I talked about. At the, the root of the tree, which we computer scientists like to put at the top and which makes sense in this case, um, is the goal, right? Copy edit a manuscript. At the operator level, those are the leaves of your tree. These are the very elementary 
user actions that we can break everything down into. Um, when you're editing a, a document on a computer, that will be pressing a key or selecting a menu option or dragging and dropping a piece of text or reading a, you know, a message that the computer pops up. Uh, but it could also be things such as gestures and a gesture-based interface or speech commands, right? So it's, it's the elementary user actions that you can not break down any further in terms of um, you know, the task. And here's the key trick. We take these elementary operators and we apply a duration to them. And that duration will be one fixed number per operator. So it's an average over many instances of that operator. For example, pressing a key on a keyboard in a, you know, in, in a normal uh, computer setting takes an average amount of time of so many you know, milliseconds. And that is the number that we use um, in GOMS. And then basically, you know, we go back up the tree and we add up the numbers and we figure out how long the task will then take on average. In between the goals at the top and the operators at the bottom, we've got methods. Methods are procedures, if you like, to reach a particular goal. Um, so for example, in order to, um, you know, uh, uh, move some text around, I need to highlight it first. That means clicking at the beginning, at the end, et cetera, and then, you know, drag it to the target location, et cetera. These methods can be recursive, of course, in the sense that they can consist of sub goals um, that are then, again, more methods. Um, and finally, with the methods, it's kind of like procedures in a programming language, really, or methods in a programming language, uh, you end up with, you know, the basic you could say programming statements of that of that model, uh, which are the basic operators that we just talked about before. We're missing one more thing, which is sometimes, oftentimes, there are many ways to reach a target. Like to delete a word, I could delete every character individually, or I could do that by highlighting it and pressing delete once. Those are two different options. And for the GOMS model to be correct, I need to figure out what the different uh, alternatives are and how long each of these will take. And then I write a selection rule, which says which of these methods I use for that sub goal. Now, of course, there will be individual preferences. Some people will never use you know, the highlight and delete thing. Even if it's a long text, they will just continue pressing that delete key. Um, but again, we're gonna look for average performance and then we're gonna apply likelihoods of the one or the other method being used by a community of users on average, right? For example, for texts to be deleted, people use the, you know, one method 30% of the time, the other method 70% of the time. All right, so here's a concrete example uh, of a sample method. And this method is one that directly breaks down into operators. So it doesn't involve calling, if you like, more sub, um, methods. It's, it's directly um, a list of operators. And it's taken from that example of copy editing a manuscript. Um, the task here is to highlight some arbitrary text on the screen. So imagine yourself sitting in front of your computer trying to highlight some text with your mouse. Uh, what do you have to do? Well, if you use the technique to do this with your mouse, then you have to move the mouse cursor to the beginning of that area. Uh, you have to click the mouse button, hold it down, move the cursor, uh, or, or in, in this case, this is a, mark, a marking variant that doesn't require you to hold it down. You click at the beginning, you set your cursor position there, you move your cursor to the end, you shift click, and you know this works if you do this in Word or any other kind of word processor today even. Um, you shift click, and then you've got your text selected. And there's one final thing that is important, and that is that you are gonna look at what you just did and make sure that you did it right. You know, did I overshoot with my highlight or something? So that's the operators that make up the goal um, of highlighting some arbitrary text, right? Very simple. And you can see with each of these, there's a number associated in seconds. And that's derived from some basic experiments that were done with lots of people that found ultimately, on average, uh, when people try to hit a you know, character on a screen to set their cursor to the beginning of this highlighting area, for example, this will take them 1.1 seconds. And guess what? You already know a technique um, to determine this number, actually do a better job at determining it, which is Fitz law. So if we know how far it is from the current mouse position to that cursor position we want to go to, we can do a better job of estimating the time that it will take. But that's not what GOMS is interested in because GOMS needs one number 
which is the average of all these possible distances and locations on the screen. Um, and so it basically is the average time to select a uh, character on the screen by clicking on it over all the variation, uh, variations that you could have. So individual, if I know the distance, I can use Fitts law. If I have to use an average estimate without knowing the distance or to give an average over many, many of these interactions over various distances, I'm using uh, this estimate from GOMS. And that's the basic story with GOMS. Um, we break the goal down into methods, sub-methods, et cetera, until I end up with operators at the leaves of that tree. Um, selection rules in between that tell me how often which method gets uh, chosen. Um, and then I go back up and add up the uh, execution times, and I know how long the task is going to take. So there's a couple of variants of the GOMS model. Uh, the first one, the original one uh, that, that Cart, Morn, and Newell proposed um, is the one that we just talked about, right? So we predict the time that an experienced worker needs to perform a task in a given interface design. Notice that we don't need the interface to be implemented, right? We can just, if we know what the interface is supposed to look like, we can do this. We don't need to build a prototype. And that is the strong point of GOMS. Jan, there is um, a Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I have a question about the Fitz law thing. Uh, to estimate a, uh, a an average, couldn't we just calculate Fitz law for many points and take the average of that? Um, yes, you could do that. Uh, so, if you wanted to know, for example, let's say you got a I don't know twenty seven inch um, uh, screen, um, and you've got a mouse that has a certain uh, gain ratio, right? So it has certain mouse cursor speed to point at things, um, you could basically say, OK, I, I know my Fitz law um, parameters for that kind of movement. I figured that out through an experiment. Uh, and then you could say, yeah, so on average, the average distance on that you know 27-inch screen um, to get from A to B is maybe, I don't know, very roughly speaking, maybe half of that, right? On average, the distance between the, the, the starting point and the end point is going to be maybe half the, uh, half the screen diameter. Um, and then that could be your that could be your value that you insert into Fitz law, and then you have a number. So yes, um, what uh, what these folks did, um, because you know pointing is is only one thing that you need to do, right? There's also cl clicking on a uh, tapping a key. You could also say I can estimate that with with Fitz law, right, uh, on a keyboard. Um, but in many cases, your hands are already above the keyboard, and you're typing quite fast. You're not really uh, homing in on every key as a as a target action. A lot of it is muscle memory. So, um, plus the this this thinking operator is something you need to um, test anyway. So they went ahead and did these measurements um, empirically and and really try just had people do lots of these tasks and uh, measured how long it took and then took the average. Uh, but you're right. Uh, your Fitz law estimate should be able to give you a good number. Uh, that should be pretty close to what you actually find empirically when you do this with, with lots of people on a given uh, device. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, and uh, so the next version uh, is the keystroke level model. And this is one that we're going to take a little bit of a closer look at because this is even simpler. Uh, it basically does away with, with all this tree construct above. It just says, take a, um, you know, give me a task. And I'm not going to look at all the various different ways to do that task and the selection rules, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just going to write down exactly directly the, the, the operators as a string. And then I'm going to add up the numbers. Um, this is really nice uh, because it's even quick, quicker to do, um, especially for simple tasks. You can do it in your head pretty much. Um, and it is very useful. So it's a simplified version of GOMS. It's very useful to compare two different designs um, of, of an interface against each other. Um, both GOMS and also the KLM, the simplified version of GOMS, this keystroke level model. I wouldn't necessarily trust the absolute numbers precisely because you know performance of people with a mouse could 
change over time. So maybe you do this with one group of users and they're not too fast with their mouse. And then 10 years later, you find, oh, people have gotten you know more proficient using this. But what is almost never wrong is the ranking that this gives you. You take two interface designs and you figure out which one is faster according to this model. And that ranking is usually pretty robust. Um, so it helps you make that key decision, which you want to do as a designer. Do I use interface design A or B? Right? Maybe A is a keyboard one. Maybe B is um, the one that uses the mouse, also sometimes known as graphical input device or GID. Um, although a GID could also be something like a pen, right? Anything that gives you a, you know, um, a, a 2D position rather than just a, a symbolic input like a key. Um, so, you know, if you have different interface designs, this helps you to determine which one is going to be relatively faster. And then there is another method. Uh, people figured out that GOMS was tended to um, overestimate the times. People were faster than the GOMS model was suggesting. You know, the, the operator numbers were right because those came from experiments, but adding them all up turned out to be estimating times that were too high. Why? Well, because our brain can actually overlap things a bit. We said earlier that people aren't good at multitasking and they're not, but what your brain is doing is while you are, for example, um, you know, let's say you are zeroing in on a, on a button to click. So you first need to move your pointer there and then you don't go there with a the pointer, then check whether you're at the right location and freeze and then click. You also already start initiating one thing before the one before is finished. So we have overlapping actions. So we have, uh, we have so shorter overall times. And this is what the critical path method actually figured out. Uh, this is a version of GOMS that uh, over, you know, considers the fact that the timings are actually overlapping, right? While one thing is happening with your, if you like your motor process or moving to a certain part, your cognitive processor and your perceptual processor are already looking at, you know, maybe are, are still evaluating the, the last um, action and look, making sure that it was right. And you, you know, your hand is already moving on to the next one. So that gives you better estimates, uh, closer to actual performance for, for tasks that have many operators um, in series. And then finally, there's a version called the natural GOMS language, which actually is more aimed at, you know, not the experts that GOMS covers, where the expert knows their task and they, they do it as fast as they can, but actually focuses on learning times and non-expert behavior, somebody who encounters maybe the interface for the first time even. Um, so that that um, variant, which we're not going to talk about in more detail, but I want to make, you know, let you know that it's out there, uh, lets you estimate learning times in an interface. All right, but just to give you a taste for what you can do with a little bit of math and some, you know, uh, a little library of, of, of results from experiments without having to build any tools or, or code any application or prototype, uh, let's take a look at this keystroke level model as this very simple um, variant of GOMS. So the key KLM takes the execution time for a task to simply be the sum of the times that are required to perform each elementary gesture of the task in sequence. So all we need to know is what are the elementary gestures for a task and how long do they take? Let's take a look at the, the, how long each of these gestures takes. And if I say gesture, uh, this is meant in the, in the HCI sense a gesture is basically anything that the user does in order to um, issue a command or enter some data, right? Um, it doesn't, gesture in, in the modern sense often means, you know, waving your hands around in, in the air, um, but gesture in the HCI sense is anything the user does, um, including pressing a key or, or moving the mouse. So here are the gesture timings. Keying, pressing a key on a keyboard on average you know, over all the various diff, you know, travel distances that you have between different key combinations, et cetera, on average takes 0.2 seconds. Um, and this actually includes immediate corrections. So you're basically typing a, a longer text and, and when you make a mistake, you immediately back up. Right? Um, pointing takes a bit over a second. So on average, again, this is 
averaging over all these different FIPS law uh, tasks um, that, that you could uh, measure, um, pointing on a, on a screen uh, with a mouse uh, takes about a good, a good second, right? 1.1 seconds on average. Um, and this is to, to a, you know, the position that you're pointing to here is, is chosen to be about the size of a character, right? This is what this is meant to be. So if you were to have actually have to hit a single pixel on the screen, um, that would be harder, would take longer. Homing um, is a 0.4 second um, action. So you move your hand from your keyboard to your mouse or vice versa. Uh, and that's an important one that we often ignore. Whenever I'm typing and the interface requires me to use the mouse to, let's say, you know, uh, select and delete some text, that means I need to first move my hands over from my keyboard, you know, at least move one hand over to the mouse and then use the mouse here and then come back to the keyboard to continue typing. Um, and then there is the mental preparation time. Um, and there are two ways to think about this. One is um, it's, it's routine thinking, basically thinking, okay, I've, I've, you know, I've selected the text. I've I, now I need to basically do the delete operation the next. And then there's gonna be a short moment of time where you stop uh, to A, you can, can consider this to be the time where you prepare for the next step or the way I like to think about it is it's the time that you need to verify what you just did, right? to, to just look at, did I, did I select the right text before you continue? So it's this short, short, of, short mental break in between things that you stop and think for a second, um, not in the sense that, oh, um, you know, am I still doing the right job here? But, you know, what's my life about? But really just, um, did I do the thing that I just set out to do with this last uh, sequence of gestures? And the last timing uh, is not a timing of the user, but it's the timing of the system. Sometimes your system will take a long time, let's say to load a page over a slow connection, right? To load a big, big file. Uh, and when you just sit there basically twiddling your thumbs, doing nothing, uh, then that time of course also adds to the execution time for a task. So we need to take that into account if it is a factor um, in the task that we're looking at. But this response time of the system, and this is something we'll get back to later because it's really interesting what you can do here as a, as a clever developer. This is where your computer science skills can shine. Um, the responding time um, is something that will only affect the user um, if they're not busy doing something else. Right? So if you are really done with your task and the system makes you wait for doing something before you can continue with your task, then the response time will really add to what you need to do. But if the system loads files in the background, you know, while you are still figuring out which one you want, it just loads all of them and makes it super quick to then open the right one once you uh, make your choice, then you would have removed that response time from the calculation because the system does it while the user is busy doing something else. And you've modeled this something else that the user is doing already in your GOMS KLM model. Um, the response time will come back to haunt us uh, uh, even more because we already know from you know, the very first lecture that after 100 milliseconds, we have a causal breakdown, right? We stop believing that something happened in direct response to what we did. Um, and uh, so that is, uh, that is a deadline that we need to pay attention to. After about a quarter second, um, the user will try again. Um, and so this is where this R starts to becoming not just add, adds to the task, but it also starts to you know, may, maybe miss operations and user frustration and so on. So it's important to give feedback that you know, input was received and, and recognized. But let's do an example here. Um, if you wanna calculate the time in the KLM model that something takes, uh, you would first have to list the required gestures. For example, uh, let's say you're mousing around in, in, in a graphical application, and in order to, um, I don't know, um, open a new file, you need to press a key, a single key. Let's say it's just an open, you know, just O for open, no command key combinations, nothing. So what do you, do you need to do is it's a homing gesture because you need to move your hand from the mouse to the keyboard and then type a letter. Now, maybe you can use your left hand to type that letter if it's really just a single key, then you wouldn't have the homing time there because you can use your left hand for the key uh, and the right hand for the mouse. That's why 
certain keyboard combinations are super quick and others that require both hands on the keyboard take much longer because the mouse the, the mouse hand needs to travel back to the keyboard. Once you've listed your required gestures, you compute the mental preparation times. Um, so once you've placed your M's and removed the ones that you're supposed to take out following those bunch of rules that I'm gonna talk about in a sec, you add up the gesture timing. So in this case, it will lead to the homing uh, move. Then there's a mental uh, operation that remains after removing most of them again, um, pointing and clicking, right? So that's your HMPK. You add up the, the timings for those according to the numbers that we just saw in the last slide and you end up with about three seconds. So you know, uh, that's the time it will take an average user on average to do this kind of action. It's actually kind of long if you think about it, three seconds. Um, in order to understand these rules for placing and removing M's, we need to go through a li little bit of uh, terminology here. Um, they, uh, these rules call uh, strings or sequence of characters, not surprisingly. Uh, delimiter is also not surprising for a computer scientist is any character that marks the beginning or end of a meaningful unit like a space or an enter, key, uh, enter character. Um, the operators we're looking at are just um, keying, pointing, and homing for now. Uh, and when we talk about an argument, uh, we mean information that is supplied to a command. So uh, let's say let's assume you have a uh, you have a command-based um, you know file browser, for example, like your your DOS or Unix command line, and you're you're moving through directories. You would type something like uh, uh, cd as you know for change directory space. Uh, and then um, a name of a um, of a directory. So CD is the command, um, the space is the delimiter, and then the name of the directory would be the argument that you provide to that command, obviously. Um, so here are the rules. First of all, we throw lots of M's into the mix. Basically, we insert M's in front of all the key presses. So every single key press that we modeled in our sequence gets a mental preparation in front of it. Which almost means like like you know basically somebody is preparing for every single key to press like you know like a very slow typist right now that's unrealistic I know but that's how we start and now we're going to remove these uh, in the next rules we also place M's in front of all the uh, pointing commands that select commands meaning you know, if you're selecting a a, a menu item uh, to for example open a file um, you know that would be selecting a command. But if there are um, you know, pointing ar uh, actions that select uh, just arguments for these commands, we don't insert them. The assumption here is that you know you have a plan to open a particular file, and you don't need to think, don't need to think twice about it, right? It's enough to think about it once, not twice, once after you know, triggering the open command, and then once again for the final one. One is enough. Um, so now comes the first rule of re how removing some of these M's, lots of them actually. Basically, um, if the second operator, operator is fully anticipated in the previous one, do you remove the M between them? What does that mean? If my task is to click on a button in the top left and I'm moving my mouse there and then I click, then I'm not going to stop in between the point and click, right? I'm just going to do the whole action. Uh, and I may have planned that before, right? There may be an M in front of the whole sequence, but I don't need another M in between these. So if, there's, if they're fully anticipated, you remove the M in between. Like there's no choice or, or anything like that that needs to be made again um, at that point. Rule number two is we get rid of M's within cognitive units. And what do we mean by that? Well. Uh, they are contiguous sequences of characters that you type that form a single name or, or word or, or term that you know. Um, like if you type your name, your first name, um, then you don't stop in front of every character, obviously. Right? But also if you type a keyboard command in you know, your file browser that you uh, use, like your Unix command line that you use a lot, like you know, CD or, or LS or something like that, or dir in, in, in DOS, then also you will not stop in front of every letter, right? It's, it's a, it's, it's one sequence, right? So here we can see, um, this is an example, right? You know, you type dear, you would have from, from inserting all these candidates from rule zero, you would have MK, 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 because of each key gets an M in front of it. 
but we remove all of them except the first one, right? So we think once, what do we need to type dir, okay? And then we go KKK, we type DIR, right? One after the other. So things are getting a little bit more realistic now with removing these M's again. We can throw out some more. If, for example, we need to, uh, we're typing a paragraph of text and we want to insert an empty line after that and then start the next paragraph, then these two, you know, took, took these two ent enter lines are like a single delimiter, right? So consecutive terminators uh, get basically folded into one, right? So we here have um, uh, the word, you know, blah, and then two returns. Um, that would be, you know, maybe um, a mental preparation in front of that, then three keys. Um, and then we would have, you know, we've already removed the M's in between this, this, this blah word because we can, you know, that could be dear, for example, the command. Um, and then we can now also remove this mental operator here because that is the one in between the two consecutive terminators. We do leave in right now still the one um, that is right in front of the first um, terminator, right? That stays in. But in rule four, we take out also uh, M's that are terminators of commands, not of arguments. That's important. Um, so for example, and you know this from experience, if you type, um, you know, if you type dear a lot in your computer, right? Uh, then at some point, this just becomes D-I-R enter, D-I-R enter, D-I-R enter. You're not no longer typing D-I-R and then thinking, okay, is everything right? Yep, I can continue on and press enter. No, it becomes one single gesture for you, right? It becomes one single stream of keys that you press in one go. And you can observe that when you watch yourself typing. So that's why if a K is a if if a key press is a delimiter that follows a constant string, like you know, DIR for, for listing a directory, then you delete the M in front of that. But if it's a varying string um, or an argument, then we don't take it out because for that we may need to actually look at what we just typed before we commit to sending it off with the enter key. So here's the example. If clear is a command you do a lot, then it becomes, you know, that mental operator at the end gets removed. Uh, you know, that would be there in front of the uh, terminal uh, character. Um, it doesn't apply if you have dir or ls followed by an argument. Um, so because then you need to actually look at the look at the argument. And now finally, we take out any mental thinking times that are happening while the system is busy anyway, right? obviously. So you're waiting for a computer response. Um, that means that we don't need to count that time twice, right? It's enough to count it once. Okay, um, this may be a little confusing. So we'll do a little exercise example here. Mm. You need to... Um, pencil and a piece of paper now. Um, and I would like you to draw um, a very simple sketch, a very simple interface. Um, you're supposed, you know, you, you're writing a little tool for Bob, who's a technician in a lab. And every now and then other folks, other researchers in that, in that lab, biology lab, are calling over um, temperatures to Bob and, and ask him to, you know, convert those into the other unit, right? Um, so somebody says, hey, Bob, how much is, you know, 92 degrees Fahrenheit in Celsius? And Bob types it in and, and reports back the results. So he needs a quick calculator tool, basically, a temperature converter tool that does that for him. Um, you need to design the interface for that tool. And you've got a couple of choices. You can use a keyboard or a mouse or a combination of both to to, to work on this. You can assume that the temperature converter, because we're going to keep things simple here, is already in the front, right? It's already the active window. So we're not concerned about launching the app or, or whatever it is, right? And we're doing this on a computer with a mouse, not, not on a smartphone. Um, we also make an assumption that we have an average of four typed keys or characters. And this includes the decimal sign and, and the point. So somebody will say maybe 70 72.5, right? That would be 72.5, uh, those are four characters. 
Um, somebody else might say minus 3.7, right? That's also four characters, minus 3.7. Um, we also will not assume any typing errors in estimating the, um, the time of, um, of using your interface. Um, and the interface can needs to be able to do both directions. That's the challenge, right? It needs to be able to convert from degrees Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius or the other way around. And we can assume that both things are equally likely. Okay. So your task is now, first of all, sketch out a, you know, a very, very simple interface that lets me do that. And once you have that, um, I will show you a sample solution here. And then I will show you how to analyze it with uh, the KLM model. And then you know, you, later you can do this with your own, or, or while I do mine, you can see how yours would have uh, uh, performed in comparison. I'll give you a minute to sketch that out. All right. Um, this should not be too complex. So I'll show you a, a sample solution, OK? Um, here's a very simple version. And, and you may have created something similar like that, because that's kind of like you know, a, a first shot at the design that, that is pretty obvious. Uh, we've got a temperature converter app, and, and that window basically has a radio button that we can move to, say, convert Fahrenheit to Celsius or convert Celsius to Fahrenheit. And it has an area where I type in my, uh, my value, and it has a second area in which the result will be displayed. Now, this is not a beautiful interface or anything. There are things that you could improve about it uh, from, a, from an aesthetic and from a usability point of view. But we're just concerned about the how fast is this interface going to be. Right. Bob is doing this a lot. So the assumptions that GOMS and also KLM have, which is experienced user, routine task, no scratching your head about what you need to do, um, do apply. So we can use the model. OK, so how do we do this? Well, we don't need to build this interface. That's the beauty, right? Um, we can think about two cases here. And I'm going to talk about these while this interface is still up so that you can understand. The first case is that I need to change the conversion direction. So somebody yells out a Celsius value to me, and I need to convert it to Fahrenheit. That means I need to move my hand to the mouse. We said that the hands are at the keyboard. Right? That, that's our starting assumption here. Uh, so I need to move my hands to the, to the mouse. I need to point to the you know, C to F button, click it. Then I need to move my hands back. And I need to type the four characters because we said on average we assume four characters. And then I need to tap enter. Apparently, you know, this is a dialog box um, with a text field, and text field will you know activate the conversion the moment I hit enter. All right, pretty clear so far. So here's the evaluation. Uh, here's the uh, calculation. This is our first case that I just talked about. We need to select a conversion direction. We need to change it from what it currently is. Move my hand over to the mouse point to the right button, you know, the, uh, the button that says C to F, and click on it. That's a homing action, H, a pointing action, P, and a keying action, K. Now, I move my hand back to the keyboard. I type in my four, four digits or characters, you know, with a minus in per, uh, uh, decimal point, and I hit Enter. So after the HPK comes another homing action, H, four keying actions, and another keying action for the act, for the enter. That's the sequence on the second line here, right over here. Um, now we are going to insert M's. First of all, we throw M's in front of everything, right? We said in front of all the um, operations that are pointing or keying operations. Notice we don't put them in front of homing because homing doesn't require me to think, right? It's something I need to do as part of trying to reach the mouse or the keyboard. So we don't have separate homing actions there even to begin with. So lots of candidate M's are now thrown into the mix here. Uh, and now we apply rule one. We delete the so-called anticipated M's, right? those that are already where you point and click at something. And that's the case when we select this um, radio button. right? Uh, so we home over, we think, OK, which is the button I need to click? And then we point at it and click. And we take out that M in between. 
Next up, we delete any M's within cognitive units. So those are the ones that are part of the four digit value that I'm typing in. You can see here, all these M's in between that were like the four digits are now being removed, right? They go away. <coughs> so now we have the sequence that I'm showing here, HMPK, and then that's the moving over and um, uh, clicking the radio button, and then HM4Ks, another M and a K, and that's entering the four digit value and pressing enter. And that one, um, I can actually, um, you know, since the other rules are, um, are not applicable in this case, we don't have any consecutive terminators here or terminators of commands or overlapping M's with R's doesn't exist. So we're done with our, um, our evaluation. And the number that we get out of, by simply adding up all these numbers here um, for this sequence is 3.7 seconds. Uh, sorry, 7.15 seconds, sorry. Uh, in the second case, the correct conversion direction was already selected. So we don't need that first part, right? We don't need to home over and click on the radio button, but the rest is the same. So in the second case, we simply have H, you know, HMPK goes away and we just keep that second part here. Um, we don't need to home twice, right? We home not at all. We are already on the keyboard. So we've got M4Ks, and then another MK, and that is 3.7 seconds. So we can see roughly it's twice as fast if I happen to have the direction already selected. We already also see, and this is why this is interesting, we can also already see, wow, just changing the direction of conversion is almost taking as much as the whole rest of this whole entering the data, right? That's a lot of time wasted on changing the conversion direction. Let's see if we can do better, right? That's what you should have in your head here. On the average, this means that we just take the, you know, the average of those two values and we end up with 5.4 seconds on average conversion time operating this interface. If you know it, if you're a pro using it and you go as fast as you can uh, with that UI design. Uh, okay. Have a question. Yes, go ahead. Maybe I missed something here, but why isn't there a mental pause between the K and the H in rule, uh, rule, rule zero? Yeah. Um, that's, I, I was mentioning that homing is not something that requires mental preparation because homing is in itself happening in order to get to the keys or to the mouse. Basically, you move from keyboard to mouse or the other way around. And the rules in, the, uh, in, in how you place that, which, which you know, Cart Moore and you will determine based on what they observed empirically, say that you don't need to place M's there because you know, you would probably, if you put them there, there would be another rule taking them back out again. You can imagine this in a way, it's a little bit, I mean, the rules say don't place M's between in front of H's, right? It just place them in front of P's and K's. But why this would be the case is if you think about what we are doing to um, anticipated M's, right? When we have a pointing and then a clicking, we say the M between the point and click, we remove. And homing is kind of the same thing, right? I'm, I need to press a key on the keyboard, so I'm moving my hand over from the mouse to the keyboard if it's not uh, there already. And that is almost like, you know, an anticipate, you could imagine that as an anticipated M as well. Is that making sense? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, all right, so we've got 5.4 seconds here. Um, we're going to go, go come back to this example later on um, to look at some alternative interface designs. Um, but first of all, for GOMS in general, uh, what are we getting out of it? GOMS is interesting because it gives me execution times, as we said, of trained routine users for repetitive goals or tasks. Um, and that number, uh, I didn't talk about the learning times here, right, which is you know in the extensions of GOMS. But just the execution times, um, knowing the time in seconds that it takes a user to do a task gives you a big leg up in industry, right? Because that you can convert into money based on the hourly wages of the person that is doing the task. Um, so it tells you how expensive it is to use the system uh, in, in daily use. Um, and if you also know learning times, then you can also start estimating the cost of training, right? Because 
uh, you know, a system that takes twice as long to learn will, you know, have more expenses in uh, both people being slow at, at doing it, but also they need somebody to, to maybe teach them. Um, so there's, there's, again, you can convert this into dollars. Um, and oftentimes, this helps you to say, well, we can buy the more expensive system, but we will save money in routine use that I can calculate to be, you know, half a million dollars per year for the company. And that will make it, you know, cheaper after, you know, it will amortize the cost after two years, for example, you know, the cost difference. Um, but it also shows that any change in a system will trigger these costs because especially the learning costs, but also, um, you, know, you know, people having to reacquaint themselves with the system uh, with a natural arms language model, you can estimate how long, you know, how much um, transition costs is being created by changing from one established well-known system to a new one. And people might say, well, but the new one is faster to use. Yeah, it is. And that gives me, you know, an average cost benefit of maybe, I don't know, $200,000 a year. But we have to remember that everybody who already knows the old system will need to be trained on the new one. And, you know, our natural garbage language model maybe tells us that the training cost is, is this much. Um, and that will, we'll have to calculate against each other. And there's one wonderful example, um, uh, 9X, which is a, 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 a phone company, um, had a, a system for its, its operators, like the people who were um, working in the, in, the, in the operations central, like not, not, not uh, you know, just, just plugging, uh, plugging plugs, this is the 90s here, um, but they were using a system that was keyboard based and it was very old school, right? Um, they were, and so somebody, some software company said, we can give you a new one where people will be using these fancy new, you know, computers with mice and, and a graphic user interface and shiny buttons and stuff like this. Um, remember, this is in, you know, this was in the early 90s. So um, we've had, you know, the, the mouse and, and the graphic user interface had kind of taken the, the office world um, mostly by storm at this point. <coughs> um, but fortunately, they invited, um, somebody to do um, a GOMS analysis on this. And they found that the new system that had this great graphical user interface um, would actually take longer to operate than the old one, because these were experienced operators um, and they would have to travel between keyboard and mouse a lot. And for that, it was just not gonna pay off in terms of execution time, because for these operators, you know, execution time is what you needed to to bring down, right? Because um, any time that they spend longer on 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 fixing a technical problem in in, in the uh, in the phone exchange um, was going to cost money. So sometimes you can even show that you know uh, a change to a new system just because of its efficiency in the long run won't pay off. And this didn't even involve talking about training costs, right? Now, just to explain this, let's, let's assume here, and this is a little question for you guys. Let's assume I am developing an interactive exhibit. Like we've been doing this a lot, right? The other day we, we reinstalled in, in, in this conducting exhibit that we did um, in, in Vienna. Um, and now I'm, I'm trying to calculate, um, you know, is, is my new version of the exhibit better than the other one? Should I use GOMS for this or not? Would GOMS tell me anything useful? for this comparison or would, would it not? Just raise your little yellow hand if you have an idea. Yeah, uh, Shailish, go ahead. Um, so uh, I'm not exactly sure if uh, GOMS would be used. It, 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 would, it can give you useful results, but uh, considering it's an interactive exhibit, uh, it's not exactly being used by experienced users. So. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That, that is the key point. This is not a routine task that somebody does eight hours a day. I mean, I would love for people to you know, hang out in the museum in Vienna and use our exhibit every day for eight hours because I love it so much, but that's not what's happening, right? People walk up to the exhibit, they use it once probably in their life, and then they move on, right? So we only have first-time users. Um, and so it doesn't make sense to apply a GOMS model here because we are not talking about experienced users executing a routine task without thinking. Um, 
plus, you know, if, if it's an exhibit that uses non-standard input devices, um, like, you know, in this case, a baton to, to wave around in the air uh, and maybe to select things, that's not even a standard input device. So I wouldn't even have the basic um, numbers for my elementary operators to, you know, I would have to find those first. But yeah, it doesn't make sense for a variety of reasons. So we can estimate, you know, effects of redesign, like the training cost versus the long-term uh, work time savings. Um, and it also, this is interesting. Um, if you think about what we just did, remember the little piece of how to do a um, selection of text, right? Select arbitrary text. Didn't that almost look like a manual, like a really, really broken down uh, manual that has like every single step lined up? And that's exactly what it is, right? Um, so if you take, if you have a good GOMS analysis of an interface, you can actually use that, reuse it to start your documentation, to start your technical documentation that explains how to do things on it. Now, not sure whether in 2021 you need to, or 2022, you need to explain to people how to select a piece of text on a, on a, on a screen, but you know, if it's the first time people taking a computer course, maybe you do, right? So this is useful to create online help, tutorials, etc. So not for casual users or for completely new user interface techniques where we don't have the numbers yet in order to uh, determine the elementary operators. If we are missing those, we need to first run experiments to determine those operator times before we can run um, a GOMS model. And they have to always be experienced users with the system um, and doing you know, a routine task that they know well. And um, we're now gonna take a look at um, a little bit more of a mathematical modeling of, of understanding what's happening in inter interfaces. Um, and we're gonna look at information efficiency and what it means for measuring the uh, efficiency of interfaces based on, on a calculation that, that determines the amount of information that travels through a system and that uh, needs to travel through that system. So the idea here is we want to figure out, is there a way to determine how fast an interface can be in theory? Um, in order to determine that, we need to think about how we um, model information in, in the HCI um, process in the, in the inter interaction. And the way we do this is we say, all right, well, information theory tells us, and you guys all know this, that we can you know, define information as, as, a, as a quantified amount of data conveyed by a communication between the human and the computer in this case. In our case, this would be um, things like speech, where you know if you have speech input, but or or messages that are being sent uh, when you click somewhere, etc. Um, and an interesting facet or 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 result of this uh, way of looking at things is that we can now actually determine a lower amount, a lower bound of the amount of information that a task actually requires. And that is not dependent on the interface design. What do I mean by this? Well, we just saw the temperature converter, right? What do we really, really need to tell the system? Well, we really need, really need to tell the system on average four key presses of you know, data, right? Which was just an average over many different possible values. So four key presses of data and it really also needs to know whether we're doing Celsius or Fahrenheit, right? So that's all it needs to know. Everything else was just there to move the interaction along, like pressing enter or actually selecting these you know, radio buttons, et cetera. This was the way that the interface made that possible. But the information that needs to go from A to B is really just those four digits and the information Celsius or Fahrenheit. So uh, what what we can then determine is if we know that there's a minimal amount of information that is required for a task, which in our case is this information theoretic efficiency E, 
uh, oh, sorry, is, 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 the, is the value above this, this um, uh, fraction here. Um, and we divide this by the actual amount of information that the user is providing. Then we, could, we can call that fraction the, or this ratio the information theoretic efficiency E. So E is thereby a value between zero and one because um, if I'm supplying lots of information and there's only very little of it is actually required for the tasks and it's not very efficient, right? So E is very small. Um, and if it's perfect, then I would provide exactly as much information to the interface as it needs and nothing more. And then it's basically, I've reached the theoretical optimal. I cannot get any, an interface. I cannot come up with an interface that's any faster than that. And that is kind of cool to know. And I've shown in the top here, uh, one where E is zero because here the dialogue pops up and I need to press okay, right? So there is some interaction happening. There's some information being basically sent from the user to the system in the form of pressing the, the okay button. But since no choice is being made, I don't have any way to influence what the system will be doing. It will just wait for me to press that okay button and then that dialogue will go away. The actual information required for the task is zero, right? There's nothing that the system decides based on me pressing that button or not pressing that button. So um, with E equals zero, the information that the UI is providing and the interaction that I'm doing as a result is not really moving the interaction along at all. It's unnecessary. So that's the information theoretic efficiency E. So let's make that a little bit more concrete um, and use um, a character-based interface. So a character interface means that we, we measure the information that's being required in characters, because that's just a mo much more practical unit to, to think about uh, than you know, information in, in this very you know, nebulous general sense. And for characters, we can gen then say, you know, okay, character efficiency is the minimal number that uh, a task requires, uh, divided by the number of characters that are actually being entered into the UI. And uh, you know, so that only works if you have a keyboard-based interface. You know, the, the mouse pointer kind of falls falls off the off the chart here. Uh, but for character-based information uh, input uh, on the keyboard, this is very interesting. And a lot of high-efficiency interactions are happening on the keyboard. Right, things that really need to be operated very quickly tend to move towards keyboard operation rather than mouse operation. Um, so this is an inter interesting thing to look at. By the way, this. Uh, look at information or interface efficiency is taken from Jeff Raskin's excellent book, The Humane Interface. Uh, this is a wonderful book that uh, I recommend you take a look at. Um, it's a fairly easy read and it's full of interesting anecdotes um, that, that illustrate the points he's making. He introduces some very useful concepts in there. Uh, Raskin was uh, behind some of the um, the original Macintosh design, the interface design for it, but he was also involved in designing other um, uh, office computing systems, and some of them, um, you know, are ac actually make better choices in terms of being efficient to use than than the the Mac did that he do, had to develop. So, how do we quantify um, the data? Well, we know that information is measured in bits, right? And one bit is representing a choice between two alternatives. That's obvious, um, and and equally likely alternatives um, are therefore going to contain uh, a total information amount of log two of n, right? If n is two, then log two of two is one. So that's why it's one bit if you choose between two things, obviously. How much information is contained in each alternative? Well, uh, per alternative, we have one divided by n times log two of n. This should be pretty clear from uh, what you know about theoretical computer science. This is the case if everything is, e each alternative is equally likely. And we're often gonna make, um, oh yes, yep, that's right, the humane interface. Um, thank you, uh, Shelly, that's the book that I'm talking about. Um, if the alternatives are not equally likely, then we need to compute it uh, based on the individual probability, right? So if we have 
two alternatives, but one is you know 70% likely and the other one is only 30% likely, we get um, the likelihood of each alternative multiplied by the log two of one divided through uh, one divided by that likelihood or probability, I should maybe say. Um, and the total amount is then the sum over all of these alternatives. Okay, so this is all very, uh, very, very basic uh, statistics and, and, and theoretical uh, computer science. Um, so what that means is we need to consider the, the, the situation that we're in as a whole, right? We need to consider what is the probability of the messages that are required and how, um, how much information are we transmitting with each of these messages? Uh, and note that information is not the same as meaning, right? Information in this classic sense here of, of you know, Shannon information channel theorems, et cetera, is just saying freedom of choice. Like the more different options I have, the higher the information is if I pick one of these options and send that across the channel. Right? That's why sending um, a character that can only be a one or a zero is only one bit, but if I send a character that can be anything out of 26 different alphanumerical characters, that's going to be log two of 26 bits of information, right? And we already talked about this earlier on in uh, when we when we looked at how much information is contained in displays, right? So it's the same principle all over again. Let's take this model of thinking about information in an interface. Um, and use that on the temperature converter. We had a couple of assumptions already. Um, we already made the assumption that we had 50% uh, Fahrenheit and 50% Celsius uh, um, requests. Um, and we already had the last assumption, only four characters are input on average um, in, in the system. We're gonna make a few more simplifying assumptions just to keep the maths here uh, tractable and you know it's not going to make a big difference if you want to become more precise and cover all the um, extra options here. Uh, the numbers aren't going to change much but this keeps the calculations um, easy to follow. We're going to make an assumption that most of the values we get are positive, three quarters and 25 percent are negative, meaning that there's going to be a minus sign as, uh, as one of those four characters that are being input. We're also assuming uh, that we all always have a decimal input. So we always have at least one decimal point, no integer number. So nobody's gonna ask me well, how much is 35 degrees uh, Celsius, right? It's always gonna be at least one decimal point. We furthermore will make the assumption that all of the digits are equally likely. That also doesn't sound completely unreasonable. Um, and instead of saying, yeah, and there are gonna be some you know, three character inputs and some are gonna be four and some are gonna be five. We're just gonna say, let's say they're all five, right? And to, to avoid this, you know, having to look at this distribution of lengths of input strings. So in other words, what you would get here is basically 50% um, of, or 75% of these requests are gonna be something like, um, a decimal number and another decimal number and then a decimal point and then another decimal number. So digit, digit, point, digit, right? That would be a typical positive request. Or in the negatives, it would be minus digit, point, digit, something like that. Um, as a result, we can now say that uh, we can evaluate this first interface with these assumptions. We know that this is the key sequence that comes out of it. And if you make the assumptions that we had before on how much value each key has, then we end up with a, um, you know, we know already that we only need four characters um, of input to really get all the information across, right? The four numbers are important. But in this interface, we're actually pressing one, two, three, four, five, six keys, right? So four keys divided by six keys is a 67% character efficiency. And we already computed uh, the, the, the numbers 
And you can see that <coughs> um, this is the inter this is a slightly changed interface here that uses no radio button, right? Because I said this character efficiency will only work if we remove the mouse from the from the interaction. So here we make people enter four digits and then a C or an F based on whether they want um, to enter a Celsius or, or Fahrenheit value. And then the system and the enter key following will convert the number in the other field, right? So it's a purely character-based interface. So we end up with 3.9 seconds and that's already faster, quite a bit faster than our mouse-based interface. And that's the first lesson I want to I want to get across here. If you manage for these kinds of things where you know there's going to be keyboard input happening, if you can design it so that the interaction does not require unnecessary trips back and forth to the mouse, you can already save quite a bit of time. OK, so next up, um, we see, however, that this is still not the optimum, right? We're at a character efficiency of 67%. We said what really only needs to make it across are those four numbers. And you may, may think, wait, wait, don't we need to also always enter this fifth character, Celsius of Fahrenheit? Well, I'll show you that we don't in, in just a second. So that you'll see that the information that really needs to make it across is just the four digits. But first, let's take a look at a second interface design. And this is one that you could probably come up with yourself once you see this one. Um, the second interface design looks exactly the same, but the instructions are slightly different, right? To convert temperatures, you type the numerical temperature, and then you enter a C if it's in degrees Celsius, or an F if it's in degrees Fahrenheit. So notice that you no longer need to press enter. Right? So you just type 39.5 C, and the moment you press C, we know that you're done entering your number. Right? That's the only thing that we're worried about. We need to determine when you are done entering your number. So by pressing C, you type onto that single key. You may have lost. Ah, oh, there we go. Um, <clears throat> and this means as a result that we're getting more effective or more efficient, I should say. So we now have the mental preparation. We got four, four keys to press. Then we need to think, okay, Celsius or Fahrenheit, right? This is sort of the, the final mental uh, confirmation here. Um, and then we enter that C or F key and the C or F key also triggers the conversion. That brings it down to 80% or brings it up to 80% character efficiency because we're now at five keys that we're pressing uh, and 3.7 seconds. So we've shaved another 0.2 seconds off the average interaction. Doesn't seem much, but it'll also feel more fluid, right? It's, it just takes one unnecessary interaction out of the equation. Now you might say, wait, what? What about the 100% interface here? Why are we not at 100% or how can we even get to 100%? We always need to tell the system whether we entered a Celsius or Fahrenheit, you know? And this is where you notice that what the character efficiency method of thinking does is it makes you think outside the box. It forces you to think outside the box. Because if you really think about it, there is no absolute need to enter the Celsius or Fahrenheit value. Why? Well, because we're doing two calculations, one of two, right? We either need to take the value and convert it from Celsius to Fahrenheit, or we need to convert it from Fahrenheit to Celsius. Why don't we just do both and let the user then read the value that they're interested in? And that's what the so-called uh, bifurcated interface design here does. So this temperature converter says, type in the temperature that you need to have converted um, and you will know whether you entered a Fahrenheit value or a Celsius value and whether you need this conversion into Celsius or, or the other way around into Fahrenheit. So after entering the number or as you are entering the number, the converted value will appear on the right hand side immediately as you type. So there's a couple of things that are noticeable here. First of all, the analysis tells us this 
bifurcated interface, uh, bifurcated because it splits into two, right? Like a cell, um, uh, only requires four key presses, right? For a four key press input. We, we said that we always enter four characters in our um, uh, statistical analysis here. That means four keys, that's 2.15 seconds. And that's a character efficiency of 100%. So at this point, we know this is optimal from a information theoretic point of view. But there are a couple things that might be not so great about this interface. First of all, you're entering a number here and you're not making a choice whether you want Celsius or Fahrenheit. You need to make that choice by reading it off these right, this right-hand side. And I don't know, but you may need to test whether people make more mistakes that way, right? Maybe it works fine. And when they enter, but they know I'm looking for Fahrenheit. So I'm gonna look into the Fahrenheit row here, but maybe, maybe not. Maybe they get confused by seeing two numbers. That's something you'd have to evaluate whether that interface works well for people. The other thing is this does something interesting. It basically does conversion all the time, right? So you enter, if you want to enter 17.5 degrees, you would enter a one and it would immediately convert the one into Celsius, assuming it comes from Fahrenheit and into Fahrenheit, making the assumption that it was a Celsius value. And as you continue typing those, those numbers on the right hand side would change, which is great. It's super fast, but what, if I need to enter another number. The earlier examples here, my, my first two examples, and also the one that we had on the last page, all kind of could easily make the assumption that once you hit enter or something like that, the value doesn't just get converted, it also gets selected as a text field, or maybe it even gets blanked immediately. Uh, whether it's selected as a text field or whether it gets Im deleted immediately doesn't make a big difference. The moment you type, something into that field again, the old value will be gone. So you don't have any extra effort to clear the text field. With this interface, you do have the effort of clearing the text field. So what do we do about that? Well, if we add an interaction to clear the text field before we can enter the numbers, we're back to a lower character efficiency, right? It's an option that you could do, but well, then you might wonder why not just stick with the, the middle one that has already 80% and doesn't have that problem. Right? Adding one character will get us down to 80% efficiency. Another option would be to say, I'm gonna make that value go away after a while. That would keep you at 100% character efficiency, but it introduces a timeout. And timeouts, as we will see later uh, in this class, uh, today or next week, are a very, very tricky beast. They often get in the way of interaction and annoy people because either the number goes away too quickly when you were trying to you know, still write it down maybe, or it is still there when you want to do the next conversion that comes right after the earlier one. We want, may want to do five converts in a row um, and then you know, the timeout may be too long. So it's tricky, but you could design an interface that remained at 100% character efficiency making certain assumptions. Yeah. Um, yep. Do you have do you have trouble trouble seeing my screen or are you are you good? Um, at least for me, I have sometimes a black frame for just a second or so on, but it's coming back all the time. And also, I have some audio issues, and the chat writes that this is also the case for some of them. Yeah. Um, so, so maybe you can check the activity monitor and, and check whether some applications are taking your uh, resources. Otherwise, no, my, my, question. I, uh, my computer isn't spinning up or anything. Fans are spinning up. I think this is, this is an internet issue. Um, uh, I'm having trouble um, with, the, with the cable internet here. Um, and that's dropping off. So I've moved to, um, to hotspotting. I'm hotspotting over LTE now. So that might lead to uh, some issues, but at least... Um, it should, it should remain up, uh, but let me know if there's more trouble, okay? In, in, in average, everything is understandable, uh, I think. So I think there's not a huge problem at the moment. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, use another, um, the next break to see if, if Wi-Fi is stable again, and then I can move back. And then there is a question. 
Yeah, uh, I think that's from Obaidu Kabir. You had your hand up. Did you have a question? Uh, yes, actually, I'm a bit. Uh, I need. I'm a bit confused about the third solution. So here we are typing a integer, for example, as a temperature. But as a user, how the user will know that if he or she is entering it in uh, Celsius or Fahrenheit, for example, for a conversion. He or she must know that that the integer he is, uh, that person is pressing is from Celsius or Fahrenheit. There is no level alongside that uh, text box. Yeah. For the um, so so uh, you're right. Uh, I, th this is design wise. That this these interfaces are not the greatest. There is things you could improve. Um, so for example. Uh, I would probably use a different look for these two um, uh, fields so that. Um, you know, you can tell that the left one is to type into and the right one is one that will only show values and not not is not something you can edit. Um, and there would ha also have to be, I mean, there's instructions above it that tell you what to do, right? Um, but they could be clearer. For example, they could talk about, you know, that you need to type that into your left hand text box and the right one will show the results. But Celsius to far or, or Fahrenheit is always clear, right? Uh, the two left designs uh, tell you to enter a C or an F uh, at the end of your number. And the right one uh, shows you, you know, what uh, you enter a number, and if you enter a number uh, and you are typing in a value that you think of as Celsius, then you just need to look at the Fahrenheit line, um, uh, the box, and that will tell you that corresponding value in Fahrenheit. And that integer we are uh, we are uh, giving in the text box is uh, in Celsius, right? That the text we, are, we will type. Uh, are you talking about the right hand uh, temperature? No, box? left hand, left hand, left hand side. The first one. Left text, yeah. Okay, so there you basically, uh, you you enter first a C and then you enter a value. So you say C 17.5, for example. And that oh, okay. tells the computer that it's a Celsius value, right? Uh, uh, so you it, literally type the, the character into the box. Is it for the bifurcated uh, solution, the right one or the left one? There, no, for the left one. The, for the left one, you type the uh, you know, check out the instructions in the in the box, right? That tells you uh, tells the user for the left hand one, you need to type the enter C, uh, character C or F, and then you need to type the value, and then you need to press enter. That's why we came up with six key presses. Okay. Um, and it does not require a. Um, it does not re require an enter key and it does not require the Celsius or Fahrenheit key press. Okay. Yes. All Thank right, you. awesome. Yeah, sure. So uh, we're gonna do a little bit more math um, because now, so far, uh, we just said, okay, four digits, right? Um, so let's look at the... Um, the question of um, how likely are each of these different alternatives? When we say that we only want to look at inputs with four characters, then we have the following options here on the left. We it could either be a minus and a decimal point and two digits, or a minus and a decimal point and a digit and another, uh, sorry, a minus a digit, a decimal point, and another digit, or a decimal point, three digits, or you know one of these other two here. So the bottom one, for example, will be 32.5, right? That, that would be an example of the bottom one here. Um, the likelihood of these, we already know, because we said that 25% of um, the, <coughs> uh, sorry, 25% uh, of the entries would be negative, right? And 75% would be positive. So that means that the negative ones, we can assume the two negative options add up to 25%, that's 12.5 per, per, per alternative. And the three bottom rows here are all the positive numbers. So we'll spread things evenly uh, and each will be, uh, you know, that means each has a likelihood of 25%. How many different values are being represented by each of these? Well, the ones where you only have two D digits can only represent a hundred different values, clearly, 
right? The ones where we where there's no minus sign have three digits. So these all represent a thousand different values. Also kind of obvious. The likelihood we already said is basically just the probability expressed here um, in the um, in you know 0.00125, etc. So this gives us basically the likelihood of this happening because of you know these there are hundred values with uh, with this probability, but you know the twenty five percent probability has to split it up between a, a thousand values. So these are actually less likely each because there are a thousand different values um, that you know can be entered as for example sorry I need to show, point shows over here. The point DDD uh, has a thousand different values. So each single one of these only has a likelihood of 0 0.00025. Okay, so now we can calculate the information in bits that each of these options communicates. If we take a look at the negative numbers, where we said you know 25% of the entries are gonna be negative numbers, and these only have a hundred different values each, because they only have two digits, uh, they have a probability of 0 0.00125. And following the you know, formula at the top here, the information content in bits per each single alternative of these, so each single value is then the probability times log of one divided through the probability, uh, divided, divided by the probability, right? And that then converts into 0 0.012 bits for these first two ones and 0 0.003 bits for the bottom three ones. So now we know that the, the information in bits of every single individual value, right? You know, for example, for minus 0.38, right? That has an information that, you know, if I choose to type that in, that has an information content of 0 0.012 bits. And now I'm going to add things back up, right? So how many different values do I have that have these two digits and, and the minus sign and the decimal point in front of it? Well, a hundred of them. So I take that value here times 100, right? So that tells me this row basically adds up to 1.2 um, bits of information for all these values together. Similarly for the next row, whereas the other three down here only have a information content in bits of three bits each, right? This is 0 0.003 times 1000. Well, and then we said that the information that is included in all these um, alternatives is just the sum of these bits, right? So we sum up these three by three, that's nine, and then 1.2 and 1.2, that adds up to 11.4 bits for each conversion message. So what have we done? We have basically calculated now the based on the on the assumptions that we're making in our in our little model of this experiment right where we modeled a certain way that the input would come in we said it's always going to be four characters and what does that mean well sometimes it has a minus sign sometimes it doesn't if it has a minus sign there's less space for digits because otherwise it would no, no longer be four characters everyone has a you know every message has a decimal point so there were these assumptions that simplified things um, and so now with these assumptions we could actually calculate that um, each message will have, because these are the options that you see here of what values the message could have and how likely they are. And we can calculate by adding these up that we are communicating 11.4 bits of information for each of these messages. Okay. So <clears throat> what does that mean? Well, um, we now know the information content of a message that's being entered as a theoretical value. Uh, you could also make things a little uh, simpler. You could also just have said, all right, I'm just, I'm not gonna go into this detailed analysis here. I'm just gonna make a simpler assumption and say um, the 10 digits, zero to nine, and the decimal point and the minus sign are all equally likely to happen. 
that would be 12 symbols. And we would then assume that these 12 symbols uh, would be equally likely at each position. And if that was the case, then the probability of each would be 1 12th, obviously. Uh, and with four characters that would get, or per character, that would then mean uh, log two of 12 information content with four characters, that's four times log two uh, of 12. But that results in a higher value, 14 bits of information. Why? Well, you know this from theoretical computer science, right? And communication theory. We have just overestimated the information content here. Why? Because we've included alternatives that actually would not incur. Uh, we've included options where more than one minus sign is in a single message or more than one decimal point. And we know that's not the case. So this naive approach of just saying, well, it's 12 different symbols, zero to nine and the two, you know, the decimal point and the minus sign. And that's going to be what you press with each character. And you do four of those. That's a rougher model. And it gives you a less precise, less, less, you know, a, a little higher um, estimate on, on the information uh, required for the task. And you can do better than that by making this slightly more involved model that we've done here. So the simple approach gives you about 14 bits here, uh, whereas um, with this precise analysis, we get a little closer to the truth here. So let's take the, the value of 11.4 because that's a little closer to the truth. And let's say that's the information, that's the theoretical information content per message that we need to get across. With that, uh, we can then take um, our information efficiency calculation and say, let's divide this by the information that the user is actually supplying. So notice that I've I'm now moving away from the question of what does the UI look like on the screen? I'm moving to the question of how do I design the input device for the user to provide that input, right? So here we can say, Let's assume um, we have a standard PC keyboard on which the user, uh, on which Bob is entering these numbers, right? On a standard keyboard, you got 128 keys. Um, and if you were to assume that each was equally likely to be pressed, then each key would represent, surprise, surprise, seven bits of information, right? Each key on a keyboard could provide seven bits of information. And that actually happens to be exactly how you would you know, you could encode that, right? You could literally take seven bits and design a seven bit code that gets all the 128 keys across, um, you know, the, the USB cable or the Bluetooth connection uh, to the computer. Now, that again um, is actually a, a little bit of an overestimate because in practice, not all the keys on a keyboard are equally likely to be pressed. And as you may know, um, you know, white noise has the most information content, right? Because it's completely random. Uh, and also, you know, equally distributed likelihoods have the highest information content. Um, if things are less like, if certain options are less likely to happen, the information content goes down. In the extreme case where one option is completely unlikely and it's always completely deterministic that the other option is chosen, there is no more information content because no choice is being made. Um, so in practice, the frequency of use of, of keys uh, will of course depend a lot of, you know, your, on your application case, but you know, spaces and e keys are, for example, are common in, in, in Western languages. Whereas let's say the backslash is, is used less frequently, for example. Um, and, you know, if you look at a bit of uh, practical data, you find that the actual information per keystroke um, in typical use cases is closer to about five bits for per key press. Um, and we said in the requirement that, you know, the average length of the input uh, specifies the temperature uh, that specifies the temperature is always four keystrokes, right? We always want to en enter four keystrokes. So we could say 128 key standard keyboard with about five bits per key in practice leads to an uh, efficiency of that input device of about 55%. Now, wait a minute, we just had an interface that was at 100%, what's going on? Well, we're now looking at how does the user actually input that data? And here we can also make design choices, what kind of input device we give the user, and that will influence how effective they are, how efficient they are. What we're representing by this is basically the fact that the user would have way 
so it's kind of wasted right we essentially have um we essentially now have wasted certain keys because they're not getting used for this task uh and they're just there to distract the user and making uh, the interaction less efficient i could just cut off everything on that left hand side here right i could just keep the numeric keypad pad for box task and just give him a numeric keypad for temperature conversion and that would actually improve things on the input side because with the 16 bit uh, 16 key numerical keypad um you now have <laughs> obviously again assuming all the keys are pressed equally you know with equal likelihood uh with equal probability we can say that we have four bits of information per key press right 16 keys four bits of information um because each key represents a choice of one out of 16 options um and so that times four because our message is four keys long uh leads to 11.4 divided by 16 and that equal you know that comes out to about 70 percent but 16 keys, we still don't need 16 keys for that task. We don't need the forward slash. We don't need the uh, the asterisk. We don't need the plus or minus. We don't need lots of these keys, right? We really only need the 10 digits, the decimal point, and the enter key. If we need the des if we need the enter key at all, right? The bifurcated interface didn't even require that. But let's assume we try one of the others. Then we can use a 12 key dedicated keypad. And that would basically lead to 80% input efficiency, right? So the smaller the keyboard gets, the less options we give the user, the higher the information efficiency on the input side gets. And this may sound like an abstract, unusable value, but what it represents in reality is we're taking away choices from the user that are useless, that he doesn't need for this task. So by doing that, we're making it easier to use the interface um, because there are less things to go, less options to go wrong, right? Less keys to press that would not be the right place. So um, what can I do with all of this? Um, yeah, so yeah, yes, go ahead, Oli. Um, when, when you were talking about the 12 key uh, keypads, I think one student mentioned a good comment in the chat. I think it's it excluding the enter key and including the minus key for the 12. Yeah, yeah, right, right, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's minus and and decimal point, and that's the 12 key. So that already does exclude the enter. So sorry, that was a wrong remark. Uh, so that last 12 keys dedicated keypad would only work with the bifurcated interface because you don't have an enter key anymore. Correct. Um, okay, so what can I do with all of this? Should you always try to go for 100% efficiency? No. Um, the point of this is it's it's an ideal to aim for, you know, like how much energy is in a, in a in, in one liter of gasoline, right? You know, you, you will never build a motor with 100% efficiency, but you should aim as high as possible. So uh, the point of this thinking exercise is you can take, you should try to determine this value and so you know how far away from the optimum are you? Because sometimes like you saw with the bifurcated interface, it may lead you to say, wait, wait, wait I, there's something I haven't, I'm not seeing yet. There must be a way to make this more efficient because we're still quite a ways away from the theoretical optimum. And of course, um, inform information theoretic efficiency is not the only goal to optimize for. There is, of course, learnability or discoverability for the first time user. Does the first time user understand the interface easily? And there's the joy of use, right? All these things um, are absolutely valid uh, points uh, to consider when you're designing an interface. It's just, I want to give you one more lens to look through at a UI, uh, a lens that is quite mathematical and that can be argued quite clearly what it means and what the impact of interface design changes is. Um, so take that in, examine it, look through that lens, uh, calculate or measure things and factor this into your design decisions ultimately. Real designs are always compromises between this goal of information efficiency in a UI, both on the 
output side and the input side. We've looked at both directions here now, right? Um, and all the other goals that you have. So moving on to the 10 golden rules. Now, you may remember that we uh, talked about heuristic evaluation as one technique, actually uh, invented by Jacob Nielsen, the guy who uh, I used as an example for the GOMS model. Um, and heuristic evaluation says, take a bunch of rules that always apply to a user interface design um, and look at an interface and see if those rules have been followed or have, uh, if they've been broken. For that, you need a collection of rules, right? And so I'm going to give you one today. And this is maybe going to be one of the most useful lists that we do in this class uh, because it's a wonderful little checklist. Um, it won't help you if you are sitting in front of a bl blank canvas and have to design your first interface or even a fresh one from a new project. But it is immensely useful if you are looking at an interface and you think, I want to understand why this interface doesn't feel right or what's wrong about it. And then you can use these rules and you can classify the kind of mistakes that the interface may have made uh, in its design um, and understand how to fix them. So that's what this is for. Um, and so let's take a look at these uh, 10 golden rules. Here's a quick overview of what they are. Um, keep it simple, speak the user's language, be consistent and predictable, provide feedback, be responsive, minimize memory load, avoid errors, help recover, offer undo, design clear exits and close dialogues, include help and documentation, address diverse user needs, and hire a graphic designer. Um, we'll go through each of these. And the first ones are going to be the ones that are probably the most important ones and the ones that most problems fall into. And that's also why we'll spend most time on them. So don't be too concerned. There will be a lot of time spent on the first two or three, and then it'll become faster as we go. So keeping it simple, let's start with that. Um, this is the most important rule. In fact, there was once a collection that I really loved. I think it was in some kind of Java interface uh, book um, that said, rule number one, keep the interface simple. Rule number two, um, I don't know, uh, use, speak the user's language. Rule number three, did you remember to keep the interface simple? You know, and so on. So every other rule was remember to keep it simple. So this is one that definitely should be kept in, you know, kept in mind. Um, and oftentimes when you do your first design, you will find if you look back at it later, uh, that it is actually a little bit too complex or too awkward to use. Um, this is because we know a lot of things about the project and we tend to design an interface that covers our thought process, but we haven't wrapped our heads around how the users might think about that process and what kind of interface they really need. Another reason why um, interfaces tend to become complex is what I call feature creep. So you may have designed a system and then consumers come in and say, well, this is great, but you know, we want this other feature. And you will always hear from those users that want another feature. You will rarely hear from those people who say, you know, I'm perfectly happy with the features that I have. In fact, you can throw out a couple. Because nobody thinks that way, right? Because everybody thinks, oh, features are good. and uh, But features can be really bad because they, they can limit usability severely. And we've talked about this already from a different angle when we discussed the three phases of technology, like the, the life cycle. Right? Um, so there will always be some consumers, markets, reviewers, you know, your Amazon reviewers for your product or your Apple app store reviews that you get when you upload your app to the store that will say, well, it would be nice if it also did this. And sometimes these things are really great ideas. They're great suggestions for extending the feature set, but the usability must not suffer. Otherwise you will go the way that many systems have gone that started as a fresh, clean, simple tool that was fantastic to use, really was you know, easy to pick up and, and did exactly what it was supposed to do. And then after five releases, you know, it gets bogged down and becomes clumsy. And then some new kid on the block comes around and does basically a clean sweep and only focuses on the core uh, tasks, does it with a more modern, fresh look. And suddenly, you know, the old giant 
um, be it Microsoft Word or Adobe Photoshop or whatever, uh, feels the you know feels the competition um, because they have moved squarely into the Baroque phase of feature overload. Uh, and experience the experience shows that you know the eighty twenty rule applies in usability too, right? Uh, eighty percent of the users use only twenty percent of the features, um, and you will rarely and with with big feature with big software sets like. Photoshop, for example, you will hardly ever find two people that actually use the same features. Right? There's always one that the other person has never heard of. Right? So this is how how um, how fractured the the space there often is. Now, um, I was very impressed one day. Um, uh, Steve Jobs got on stage for I think macOS. I don't know um, ten point five or something around that time, uh, and said. And here's the list of the new features that the new version of macOS will have. And it had a big fat zero on the slide. And he said, we're not going to do any new features. We need to do some cleanup. We're going to fix the things that we've introduced last time. We're going to use the user feedback and improve it, improve responsiveness, make the systems faster again, fix things under the hood. But we're not going to throw more user features at you guys. Um, and that's a, that's a bold step, right? You know, how are you going to sell that? Sometimes it works, right? If it's part of a larger uh, strategy, so it could be an honorable goal um, to say, "I'm going to release a new version that um, doesn't fix just fix bugs, right? It does make changes, but not just to add more features. Maybe just to be easier to use. That's an honorable goal to have. If you're really pressed to add more features to your system, then you need to think about how you can move these out. There's a concept called progressive disclosure. So you reveal things over time, progressively, incrementally, and, and you know you move basic, basically ad advanced features out into sub dialogues, right? So that they don't clutter the interface right at first at first look. I've got a couple examples for this first super important rule. Uh, this is taken from an older version of Mac OS X, um, Mavericks, I think. Um, that option has actually gone away recently, unfortunately. So, um, but um, this is a version of the Finder uh, that uh, was called the Simple Finder, and and for many years Apple had a Simple Finder option. The Simple Finder. Look at the file menu here. Look at how many entries there are. There is only one entry that says close that window. All the other things that you typically expect there, you know, uh, create a new folder and uh, you know, create aliases to files or links to files and, and change the view to list versus detail, blah, blah, blah. It's all gone. All has been removed. There's only, there's no double clicking in this. You know, you start things by single clicking in this one. There's no dragging files around in this one. Um, there's only one window in this finder. It has a fixed size and a fixed view. There's no toolbars on this window. There is no concept of folders. You can create folders, but you need to create them from inside your applications. Like when you're in Word and saving your file, you say, I want to put all these letters into a new folder called letters. You can do that in Word, but not in the Finder. Um, or your administrator can do it for you if you are inside a simple Finder environment on the Mac. You only have access to a specified set of applications, again, defined by the administrator of that computer. All the other apps are not even visible to you. So, there are lots and lots of ways in which this uh, makes things much easier. Of course, it also limits your interactions with it. But I can tell you, um, I had a, we all do have to do this, right? We're all IT specialists for our extended families. And I set up a computer for my, for my mom. And sure enough, I enabled the Simple Finder. And she got along with it just fine. Right? It did all the things that she needed to do. And it removed so many unnecessary features from the interface for her that it was the right choice. Um, now, in order to make these kinds of you know, simple finder approaches, like this one I really like, uh, so I've got my little you know, thumbs up over here, um, a lot of applications need to play together. And for example, what happened, and then when, when we installed Office at some point there to, to get our Microsoft Word, uh, that actually would create a settings folder inside this thing, which was very confusing, because that was not something that she wanted to see there or that meant anything to her. Um, and so Office didn't understand that the Simple Finder was a thing under macOS and didn't follow the rules for how to play nice with the Simple Finder. Here's another example, uh, Blu-ray players, right? 
um, there is a question. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my question is, uh, what do you think of uh, buttons like uh, if, for example, if you have a simple finder that in the file menu, for example, you could turn on advanced mode. So the, the general state for the general user would be the simple state. But anyone who knows their stuff, any administrator, could always switch to an advanced mode. Do you think that's a would be a good movement or not? Um, well, there's a couple of things about to say. This is more complex than you might think. Um, first of all, yes, of course, uh, we actually have rule number nine or ten or so that says provide options and shortcuts and stuff to experts. Right. So um, not everybody for not not for everybody the simple finder interface is the right one. I would go crazy with the simple finder using it, right? Because I'm a pro using you know, you know, the, the, the Mac and I have other demands on it and I have also other levels of expertise using it. So um, first of all, providing options to users can make sense, like moving, letting them switch from the simple finder to the full finder if they need it. But then there are two different design goals. One is, I just wanted to make sure that my mom didn't end up in a dark corner of, of the Mac OS where, that she couldn't find her way out of, right? So I would expect her to occasionally maybe have something that she wanted to that wasn't possible with this, but then she could just give me a call and let me know. And then I could do that in an, you know, with a different user account or logging in as an administrator. Um, so if you want to protect people from ending up in, in corners they, they don't, they, they shouldn't end up in, then you don't provide that option. If you want to provide that option, then it's more about, hey, we're going to give you an, a simple interface to start with, and you can switch to a pro interface if you feel like it. Uh, that's a bit like hiding things under these um, you know, submenus that I said, like progressive disclosure. So it's basically the same principle. Right? You say, hey, if you go into this advanced settings thing here, then you will see more things that we are trying to keep away from you for the moment. But it's a slightly different design goal. Uh, and then finally, we have to realize that, first of all, it's not easy to classify people as beginners and experts only. We talked about this when we talked about user classification. It's not the only way to think about users. In fact, Jeff Raskin has a nice section about that in his book. I think I mentioned it back then. So it's another reason to take a look at the humane interface. Um, and people move back and forth, right? If you've used the system for a while, you get more expertly at it, and then you may not see it for a year. You come back to it, you know, and then you're like, oh, wait a minute, I forgot how that works. So you're kind of, you oscillate between these things sometimes. So a definite no on systems that automatically try to gauge your progress and then change as they go. This was something that Windows did at one point and it drove people completely nuts, right? You'd just gotten used to the system and then all of a sudden it decided, now it's time to, you know, show you the real deal and then your interface changes. That's terrible. But giving people the option to move to a different UI can make sense. Okay, but that's a great question, and it's a whole, it's probably a whole lecture behind that question alone. Um, so, onto the Blu-ray player. Um, that's a wonderful example for feature creep, right? You originally got a Blu-ray player, and hey, it would play Blu-rays. That's great. But then, how do you sell more Blu-ray players once everybody's got one? Well, you start putting things like you know apps on it, you know net Netflix and whatnot, and ultimately you end up with a whole web browser on your Blu-ray player, which probably is not the greatest idea, right? It's just not the best device to do that. Uh, and what it does, it yes, it adds more features. You can do more with it, but it doesn't add the same kind of value to it that the original Blu-ray play function. We talked about this in the um, technology phase cycle, right? This is, you know, you're moving beyond the sweet spot and, and inter entering the Baroque phase quite clearly here. So um, here's another example. Um, I wanted a new alarm clock years ago. And um, I looked at the ones that were available you know, online and on media, at media Mark and so on, and, and they were terrible. Rows of identical buttons, um, you know, display uh, options in there, like for setting five different alarms for three different people that I didn't need. Um, and so I ended up building my own. Um, now, that's not an option everybody has, but I did it in order to show and demonstrate some usability principles. For example, I realized that there may be families that need their alarms adjusted to the minute, right? Hannah gets up at 7.03, goes to the bathroom, and then at 7.19, you know, Steve can get up and go to the bathroom. That possibly, yes, but that was not my case, right? I didn't need it that precisely. So I 
only ever needed to really adjust alarm set times by the quarter hour. That's all I needed. I need to get up at 8 or 8.15 or 8.30, but not at 8.13. No need for that. So why make that setting available if I don't need it, right? It's just, it's right as Raskin was explaining, I increased interface efficiency by making my alarm settable only in 15 minute intervals because that's all I needed. That's all the precision I wanted. And you did that by setting the uh, turning that knob, the dial on the front. That was a choice in order to have a natural mapping between the time and, and, the, uh, and setting the alarm. So normally, if you wanted to adjust your time from 8 to 8.30, you have to reach over and hold the button down and then time it right to let go at the moment when it's at 8.30 and then it speeds up in between and, and you go too far and it's annoying and, and you're tired and you want to just go to bed and set your alarm. You don't want all of this. Um, and with this one, it's just reaching over. It's a nice clicky button. So I turn it click, click, you know, and I'm done. And I can see it immediately at the lower bottom display what the alarm setting is. Um, and so another thing was like, you know, how do you, um, how do you see whether an alarm is set? Some systems would have a tiny little clock somewhere, like a tiny little bell logo that told you the alarm is on, but then you might not see that when you're tired and go to bed. Um, and this one just, if there's a time at the bottom display, that's the alarm. If there's no alarm set, there's no time displayed. This buys usability at the cost of having a second display, which of course adds a few cents to the bill of materials. So, you know, a cheap Chinese clock will not do that because, hey, that's expensive to do. So we're just going to put the alarm time as an alternative display onto the main display, and you need to switch between the two with a mode button. Um, but you know, from a usability point of view, this was the better design. So it keeps things simple, right? Here's another example. Here, clearly, somebody discovered, you know, probably smoked something and then discovered the tab function in his interface builder, right? This is a screen from an e-learning uh, administration software. Um, and uh, it's, it's wild, right? This is way too complex, right? You don't want four rows of tabs in your interface. Uh, so that's not keeping it simple. Um, so keeping it simple doesn't mean necessarily that it is simplistic, right? You need to look for your task and for your users. And sometimes a complex interface is the right one. It needs to have adequate complexity. An interface for somebody who spends his day in you know, working at Lufthansa, taking calls from customers who want a flight booked and does these flight bookings in their uh, online system needs a complex interface that's very fast and very efficient and very high powered, right? But it needs to be simple for the task and the user. That's why you need to know user and task in order to determine what's the right level of complexity that's inherent in the task and then keep it as simple as you can with that knowledge. Rule number two, speaking the user's language. Um, this means that you wanna take words and concepts from the application domain of your, your app um, or your system, not from the technological domain. Meaning that, uh, for example, an architect who maybe is new to computers uh, knows what a drawing is, but they know, may know, not necessarily understand what, what a file means, right? So if they are doing drawings on the computer, call them drawings, don't call them files. How do you find out about these things? Well, you talk to your users, you do interviews, and you write down the terminology that they use describing their own tasks. If they say, well, and then I start a new drawing and I get out my pens, uh, then you want to talk about pens and drawings in your interface and not uh, about drawing, you know, uh, design tools and files or something. Now, using this for words is a simple example, um, but it also applies for more complex and abstract things. For example, you want to make sure that you understand um, in a shop that they are taking orders, right? An order is a whole process, right? A whole task is structured around the concept of an order. Uh, and if that is the case, then you need to understand what that means, what that looks like and how people deal with this task. So you need to really understand the application domain, its structure, its processes, its work processes, its tasks, its, its, its vocabulary, um, the roles people have. And all of this needs to be 
termed and, and named and structured and be reflected in your software so that your software right, fits right into the work practice rather than making everybody learn a completely new set of words. Uh, the um, SAP introductions in, in the, at the university often are, a, are an example of the exact wrong way to do that uh, by throwing terms at people that nobody has ever heard of um, simply because SAP decided to call it that in their software. Right? So that's the wrong way to go. I mean, we're talking about equivalent equivalency nodes, for example, in our new um, uh, grading software right, that we're used to to manage classes and courses at the university. And equivalency nodes mean nothing to anybody who's been teaching at the university because they are a computer science term that made it into the interface. Completely ridiculous. Um, Here's an example of a system. This is a remote for a pretty expensive um, um, you know, receiver that you might have at home for you know, your various um, hi-fi needs. Um, it's got a bunch of buttons at the bottom that I find entertaining, right? So there are arrows up and down, and then there's another set of arrows up and down. So I don't know which one does which, right? They're not labeled apart from arrows. But then there are three buttons below that that are labeled S, M, and E, X. And I don't know what these mean, but I would maybe think maybe if you're like go online shopping and you buy clothes, maybe you can select your clothes size there. I don't know. The only one I understand is that little crossed out speaker symbol, right? That one makes sense. Um, furthermore, above that, we have soft buttons, right? We've got these four rows of buttons labeled above in the display there. Uh, so once you figure out that the, the, that the labels are on the screen, then you might wonder, okay, mode, that's not very meaningful. I don't know what that does. Info, yeah, I could kind of probably guess what that does. A slash CH, I don't know. Does that mean this is a system for, German, uh, for Germany, but you can also use it in Austria and Switzerland? I don't know. And device, yeah, no idea what that does. Uh, and then there are buttons on the screen itself. Tuner and TV and VCR1, I can make sense of. But DSS, is that Deutschland sucht den Superstar? I don't know. Right? Um, and then there are buttons for AD and ATT, whatever those are doing. Right? Very confusing um, arrangement. So, <coughs> and even the, the, this thing in the middle, I don't even know whether I press that or dial this. It's actually a dial that you can turn. But what does it do, and 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 what are the actions that I'm supposed to do on this? So all the rules are being broken here. This thing, especially in terms of speaking the language of the user, does not follow the principle of speaking using words from the from the experience domain of of the person. Here's another example. A bunch of years ago, um, the uh, German magazine Connect asked us to do a study for them that they published in their magazine. Uh, where we were asked to compare in tablets at the time and judge how well you know people could use them that hadn't had any prior big experience with using other tablets or, or smartphones. Um, and so we picked up, among other things, we picked up a Samsung tablet. And uh, just look at the home screen here, and you will immediately see some significant problems. For example, what does the... I know what the alarm is, app probably does, but what would an all share play button do? Well, there, there is a play logo on it. So maybe that is something to playback media. I don't know, but I'm completely flabbergasted understanding what an app that is called S suggest does or uh, you know, PS touch or Samsung app. What are these, right? We don't know, right? So uh, the names of these are are chosen really badly, right? So these, some of these really don't make any sense to, to folks. So that's bad design. It's picking names because it's trying to frantically brand an Android interface with its own Samsung flavor. It's throwing this thing in there um, and it's just confusing users who pick this up and are like, okay, I, I, I wanna you know, write a letter. So how, how do I do that? You know? um, By the way, uh, browsers are, are famous for that, right? You have Safari, Chrome, the, Opera, all these names don't mean internet uh, browsing to, to people. So they always have to learn that extra term to understand that this is actually the internet browser, the web browser. Um, 
Here's another example for, for using the, uh, speaking the user's language. Uh, Apple Music does a pretty good job. Um, it actually, when you look at its menu options, it talks about music, songs, video, movies, playlists. It doesn't talk about files. Um, and this is true in the menus that you drop down, in the dialogues that pop up, but also in the online help. This will, you know, this is also relevant for consistency, which is rule number three coming up. Uh, there are exceptions though, and those tend to make sense. For example, the file menu is still called file. Like the top level menu is called still the file menu. Why? Because Apple has a rule, as you can see at the bottom there, um, that the second menu in every uh, application next to the, you know, the first menu all has, always has to have the name of the app. The second menu is always called file. That's always true. And um, so some of these things will actually then lead to um, conflicts, right? There is a conflict between, am I trying to be consistent with other apps on the platform, which in this case, Apple did, or am I trying to be consistent with the application domain of the music app, which is different than the application domain of, let's say, the, uh, the, the, the spreadsheet app, the numbers app. I talked about rule number three, consistency and predictability, right? And consistency is needed across a lot of different levels. You need to use similar commands for similar situations, um, but you also need to use consistent terminology in your menus, your dialogues, your help pages, and so on. That's what I just mentioned, what, what, where Apple paid attention and use the same terms across all their different media that the user encounters. Um, but consistency goes even further. Uh, remember, Consistent fonts, layout, color coding, upper lower use of upper lower case throughout the system should be consistent. When you encounter an app that doesn't do that, it just looks strangely unprofessional. It just doesn't ooze quality, right? It doesn't say I'm a high quality product. People will notice. They may not be able to put their finger to it, but they will notice that it's not professional. Um, and there are sometimes, of course, exceptions, right? You know, you always provide clear text echo when somebody presses a key, uh, a letter key, but when they're entering a password, of course, then you don't, right? Um, or you may always execute commands immediately, but if they're, if they're erasing a file or a whole hard drive, then you give them some extra security check to make sure that that doesn't throw them off. We've, in fact, seen some examples of that, and this is a good one. Uh, the star had these same physical buttons, physical buttons actually, that you would use to copy a file or copy a word in a text editor or copy an object in a graphics program, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a good example of consistency. And with the, even though we don't have the dedicated keys anymore, cut, copy, paste have keyboard shortcuts um, that you know we still use across different applications. So that's good, a good example of consistency you have a better chance at consistency if you are in the lucky position to be able to do what's called vertical design. With vertical design, I mean that one and the same manufacturer can actually make the hardware, the operating system, the applications, the key applications at least, and the user interface. And that's true, for example, uh, with, with Apple's like iPhone, but also, um, you know, the Macs, of course, the, 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 that, that are also all designed from the hardware to the uh, applications and OS and, and UI in-house. But also, for example, TomTom with their, with their NAFSATs when they were a big thing, um, you know, the GPSs that you would glue to your car dashboard, they were in the same you know, lucky position that they had everything under one roof. So the guy who was designing the mute function um, on the iPhone could literally walk over to the next uh, hall and say, hey, you're working on that mute button on the side of the phone there. Can we make sure that this works consistently and that, that can I understand how it works so I can reflect on that in my UI design and the software? Um, if on the other hand, you look at, for example, Android phones or, or Windows tablets or, or computers, um, then you don't get that, right? Because a Windows computer runs Windows, but it has no idea what hardware it's running on. Uh, Microsoft has a much, much harder time at building on this consistency because they have no, don't have the same level of control over the hardware in which they need to be running. That's one of the reasons why also Microsoft decided to release its own series of hardware products where they could control these things more tightly. 
And of course, Android is just repeating that same issue uh, in the mobile world where it's a wonderful open platform that has lots of possibilities that you don't have under iOS, but it has to live with the fact that lots of different manufacturers create the hardware and uh, even brand the UI, rebrand the UI to their own tastes so that things can become, you know, it's much harder to keep things consistent across these different levels. Um, as the last point before we wrap this up and, and close for today, um, consistency also means predictability. And this is a wonderful principle to leave you with, the principle of least surprise. A system, if you're wondering between two design decisions, always ask yourself, which of the two options will surprise the user less? Because guess what? People don't play, you know, don't, don't use their computer and write, you know, letters or do their taxes on it in order to be surprised a lot, right? That's when you game, when you play computer games, but usually you don't want surprise. You want things to be predictable because surprise usually then in these cases leads to confusion and irritation. So don't do unexpected things. Don't suddenly pop up a dialogue and also you know that, that nobody expected and don't make actions unexpectedly difficult. Like if I want to print something in duplex, that should be really easy because that's such a common demand. The point behind predictability is one of the most fundamental driving forces of, I would like to say, the human existence, right? Uh, users, humans, like to be in control. We all like this. Remember, we talked about these things um, when we went over things like personas and how you think about what users want and how you talk to them. Um, people always like to feel competent using technology, interacting with their environment. So they should be initiating actions the system responds like a good tool, right? You don't want a system that suddenly surprises you. Uh, the principle of least surprise, here's an example, right? Um, I've seen people talk at a, um, at a conference and all of a sudden in the middle of the presentation, you know, this dialogue pops up, your battery is fully charged. And that is terribly annoying. It reminds me of Clippy, right? Hi, I'm Clippy, your office assistant. Would like some assistance today. A lot of people were terribly annoyed about that simply because it was interrupting you when you were in the middle of something, you were in the flow of writing something, and then this thing pops up and pulls you out of the, uh, the flow. This does feel a bit like the computer is becoming more human, but it feels like the computer is becoming this obnoxious child, right? That's just wants your attention right now and right then. If I want a computer to be more like a person, then I would like it to be this butler, right? That, you know, when my computer is fully charged and I'm in the middle of a keynote in front of 2,000 people and, you know, my trusty butler would say nothing at all. And only after the talk, when I walk off the podium, you know, he says, oh, <clears throat> by the way, Professor Borges, your battery is now fully charged, right? That is how you want computers to behave if they are trying to be human at all. This is one of the reasons why the PowerPoint office assistant was so annoying, right? Here's a wonderful example of this thing. Um, you would start, and, and this is almost impossible to believe, but this is how it works. Um, you would start building your, your slideshow and you would tap on something, you would, you would click on something that was not editable unless you went to the master slide view. Okay, so up pops this little office assistant, Clippy, or on the Mac, it was a tiny little Mac Plus, um, and said, oh, you know, this object is on the master. So and then you've got these options there, completely non-standard uh, dialog buttons where I don't even know whether they are buttons or whether I can click them or not. Um, and the really, really weird option, thanks for the tip. So I can, what does that mean? If I click that, does it mean it comes back more often? Hopefully not, right? What's missing here is the option to say, go away and never ever come back as long as I live, right? That, that's not there. But this gets better because you are in the middle of making a presentation, right? It's like three hours to the deadline. You really need to finish this. This thing pops up. You're like, I just want this to go away. So you click, okay, you just want it to go away. It doesn't go away. A second bubble appears that says, sorry, you must first click an option before you can close the assistant. Please, and this gets even better. Now you need to click okay on this dialog and then it goes back to the dialog before and then you need to pick an option and then you can click okay. So it's like, boy, at this point, everybody's just Googling, how do I kill the office assistant, right? 
So that's terrible design because it gets in the way of the user's flow. And that is why we are, we have a major design uh, trick that developers love to use and that is terrible to use. And that is timeouts. Timeouts are when you make the system decide something for itself after a certain essentially random amount of time that you as a developer pick. One example, you're going down the, the street, you're, you're getting close to a, to a busy intersection here in Aachen and you wanna take a left turn. You also have your Sender Suchlauf. So you have your, you're looking for a radio station uh, by going through all the stations automatically, right? So as you hit that intersection, that radio station comes up that you wanted to listen to. You got two options. You can risk your life and take your hand off the steering wheel and hit that station search stop button within the next five seconds, and then you will stick with that station. But then you may also create, you know, a terrible accident. Or you go around the corner, you know, at the busy intersection as you were as, in a safe manner, but then your station search has moved on and has skipped past the station you wanted to listen to. So now you have to listen to all the other stations again, and probably even more stations because the second time around it will play even you know the the weak stations because apparently it didn't hit the one you wanted the first time around, right? So that's an example where a timeout can really mess you up. So timeouts are evil. Just keep that in mind. Timeouts are always evil. There is very very few examples where timeouts are ever useful. Does anybody remember typing on these? pre-smartphones when you had to use a uh, multi-tap. So the way that you would tap, for example, the letter H on this would be that you press the number four, not once, but twice in rapid succession. It would first be a G and then you press it again and it turns into an H, right? The biggest problem that people had with this was not the multi-tap, but the biggest problem was if you wanted to type two Gs, one after the other, to write a word like arpeggio, right? you would have to actually hit the letter four and yet you have to wait a little moment until this thing times out. And then only then you can hit the, the four key another time to write your second G. If you didn't, it would go from G to H and you would have to correct that. I know people who actually would work around this timeout by hitting the letter, the, the key, the four key to get a G, then hit any other key and hit backspace because they were you know, just typing a random key and then hit four again, just to be able to keep typing, not be pulled out of the flow. So terrible design. And what's behind it? A timeout, right? Because there's a certain time within which you, when you press the key again, it will actually lead to a different letter. And after that, it will no longer do that. And this can either be too short that timeout or be too long. It is never the right length, right? Mathematically impossible to make that time what exactly the right length. You will always disappoint the user in one way or the other. Here's another one, fresh from the latest iPhone. Uh, you open that up on your home screen, there is a little camera icon. Um, you cannot just tap that briefly. Apparently, Apple didn't want you to accidentally trigger the camera when the phone is still locked. Well, how do you, how do you open it? Uh, you actually have to click and hold. Uh, so that's another timeout, right? That's bad design because this, even if it's a short timeout, it's annoying. You know, it, it will force you out of your normal um, normal habits. Um, and that's an example where it used to be that you could just press harder on this and then it would trigger, but Apple removed the force touch features out of its latest iPhones again after a few years. And so now it's a timeout. And here's probably the, the worst timeout of all, uh, an emergency exit in the US, these often have these security bars, right? Uh, so you need to push against this bar at the bottom and then the door opens, right? Um, but this is also an exit from a store. So they didn't want people to run out and, and steal stuff. What they did is you have to press this bar for three seconds, three seconds, and then a timer starts, a second timer starts that 15 seconds later will unlock the door and open it. Probably meaning that by that time you've already been, you know, grilled to a crisp from the terrible fire that's raging behind you, or you've been smashed to pieces by all the other people behind you who also want to make it out of this emergency exit. This is, this is really um, terrible use of, of timeouts. All right, talking about timeouts, time's up. Uh, I'm gonna finish up for today. Thanks everybody for listening. And uh, next time we will continue discussion, the discussion of um, the golden rules in interface design. Uh, and the next ones will be much quicker.
Thanks, everybody. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.